Good day, everyone. And for today, I will discuss the most talk issue of the environment. And even in the beauty pageant, it is the most discussed topic, which is the climate change. It has also a negative impact to our country. And the impacts of climate change in the Philippines are immense, including annual losses in GDP, changes in rainfall patterns and distribution, droughts, threats of too biodiversity, and food security, sea level rise, public health risk, and endangerment of vulnerable groups such as women and indigenous people. According to a 2022 survey, 73% of respondents in the Philippines believe that climate change was serious and an immediate threat to their country and well-being. Others also perceive that climate change as an important issue that deserves to be monitored. In first thing first, these are the things that we should prepare. Of course, you need to have beside you your notebooks, paper, and pencil to jot down some important information that you will get through our discussion. And we have our goals for today's discussion. First is to investigate how the global, global climate has changed and examine some theories on why it has changed. The Earth's Changing Climate 18 years ago, 18,000 years ago, the Earth was in a grip of cold spell with alpine glaciers extending their ice fingers down river valleys and huge ice sheets, which is the continental glaciers, covering vast areas of North America and Europe. Presently, glaciers cover only about 10% of the Earth's land surface. Most of this ice is in the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. If global temperature were to rise enough so that all of this ice melted, many major cities such as New York, Tokyo, and London would be inundated or mulubog sila. Mulubog ang mga siyudad such as the New York, Tokyo, and London. Even a rise in global temperature of several degrees Celsius might be enough to raise sea level by about half a meter or so and flooding coastal lowlands. First, we should determine the past climate. Other evidences of the global climatic changes came from core samples taken from ocean floor sediments and ice from Greenland. A multi-university research project known as the CLIMAP or the Climate Long Range Investigation Mapping and Prediction. It says there are thousands of meters of ocean sediments obtained with hollow centered drill were analyzed and the sediment contains the calcium carbonate shells of the organisms that once lived near the surface. Because certain organisms live within the narrow range of temperature, the distribution and type of organisms within the sediment indicate the surface water temperature. In addition, the oxygen isotope ratio of these shells provide information about the sequence of glacier advances. And for example, most of the oxygen in the sea water is composed of 8 protons and 8 neutrons in its nucleus. So, giving it an atomic weight of 16. This is the common atomic weight we had known for carbon for oxygen, which is the atomic weight of 16. However, how about, how about, however, about one out of every thousand oxygen atoms contain an extra neutron. So, what will happen if that oxygen contra contains extra two extra neutron. It gives an atomic weight of 18. So the oxygen will be will have the atomic weight of 18 instead of 16. When an ocean water evaporates, the heavy oxygen 18 tends to be left behind. Consequently, during periods of glacier advance, 
the oceans which contains less water have a higher concentration of oxygen-18. Since the shell of the mar marine organisms are constructed from the oxygen atoms existing in ocean water, de determining the rate of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 within these shells yields information about how climate may have varied in the past. A have higher ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 in the sediment record suggests a colder climate while the lower ratio of while well, the lower ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 suggests a warmer climate. Using this data such as this, the climate project was able to reconstruct the Earth's surface ocean temperature for various times during the past. And then next evidence is the dendrochronology. What is this, this dendrochronology all about? It is the study of annual growth rings of trees. The changes in thickness of the rings indicate climatic change that may have taken place from one year to the next. As a tree grows, it produces a layer of wood cells under its bark. Each year's, each year's growth appears as a ring. The growth of the tree Rings has been correlated with precipitation and temperature patterns for hundreds of years into the past of a various regions of the world. And also, we have this other data that have been used to reconstruct past climates. First is the records of natural lake, bottom sediment, and soil deposits. Second is the study of pollen in deep ice caves, soil deposits, and sea sediments. The certain geologic evidences, which is contains the ancient coal beds, the sand dunes, and fossils, and the change in the water level of closed basin lakes. The documents concerning droughts, floods, and crop yields. The study of oxygen isotope ratios of corals and calcium carbonate stones that grow in the inner ears of fish. And last is the dating of calcium carbonate layers of stalactites in caves. Despite all of this data, our knowledge about past climate is still incomplete. Now that we have reviewed how the climatologist gains information about the past, let's look at what this information reveals. Okay, climate through the ages. Seven million years ago, one glacial period occurs. So throughout much of the year's history, long before humanity came into the scene, the global climate was much warmer than now. Within the global mean temperature, perhaps between 8 degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius warmer than it is today. And during the most of this time, the polar regions were free of ice and this comparatively warm conditions. However, were interrupted by several periods of glaciation, geologic evidences suggest that one glacial period occurred about 700 million years ago, and another about 300 million years ago, another glacial period then occurred also. And the most recent one, the Pleistocene Epoch, or simply as the Ice Age, began 2 million years ago. Then we have 18,000, 18,000, then after the Ice Age began, 18,000 to 22,000 years ago, the North American glaciers reached their maximum thickness and extent. Then 14,000 years ago, there is a surface temperature that slowly rose, and 11,000 years ago, other average temperature suddenly dropped, and North Eastern, North America, and Northern Europe reverted back to glacial condition. However, 10,000 years ago, the cold spell known as the Younger Dryas ended. In 8,000 years ago, the continental ice sheets over 
North America were gone. In 6,000 to 5,000 years ago, climate was probably 1 degree Celsius warmer than at present. And 5,000 years ago, the calling trend set in. So let's summarize the climatic conditions that led up to the Pleistocene. This time frame represent the warmer, the warmness of the current interglacial period or the Holocene epoch. And for this reason, the warm spell is referred to as the mid-Holocene maximum and because this warm favor, period favored development of plants. It is also known as the climatic optimum. About 5,000 years ago, a cooling trend set in during which extensive alpine glaciers returned, but not continental ice sheets. Next is that during this time, vineyards flourished and we wine was produced in England, indicating warm, dry summers and the absence of cold springs. It was during this warm, tranquil period of several hundred years known as the medieval climatic optimum that the Vikings colonized Iceland and Greenland. It is the 1,000 years ago wherein the northern hemisphere was relatively warm and dry and that 1,200 years ago, that in the year 1,200, the mild climate of Western Europe began to show extreme variations. And around 14,000 to 1400 to 1550, the climate moderated. However, starting in the middle 1550s, the average temperature began to drop. This cooling trend which con continued for almost 300 years is known as the Little Ice Age. Diba kanina, we have the Ice Age. So, this 1400s to 1550 up to before be, or before the 1800s we have the we have the age wherein we also it is also known as the little ice age and during this times the during this time the global mean temperature dropped by about 0 0.5 degrees celsius which allowed the alpine glaciers to increase in size and advance down river canyons Winters were long and severe summers short and wet. The vineyards in England vanished and farming became possible in the more northerly latitudes. Cut off from the rest of the world by an advancing ice pack, the Viking colony in Greenland perished. And 1800s, and in 1800s, the average global temperature began to rise and in 1900s until the 1940s, the average temperature of the lower atmosphere rose nearly to 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. And in 1960s and 1970s, cooling trends ended over most of the northern hemisphere. Until the 1970s and into the 1980s, overall trends pointing to warming. So there is already a global warming. And in 1990, the warming trend continues. Why hasn't the riddle of fluctuating climate been completely solved? One major problem facing any comprehensive theory is the intricate interrelationship of the elements involved. For example, if temperature changes, many other elements may be altered as well. The interactions among the atmosphere, the oceans, and ice are extremely complex and the number of possible interactions among this system is enormous. No climatic element within the system is isolated from others. Within this in mind, we will first investigate how feedback systems work and then we will consider some of the current theories of climatic change. These are the possible causes of climatic change. We have the positive for this uh, for this feedback mechanism. We have the positive and the negative. The Earth atmosphere system has a number of checks and balances that help it to counteract tendencies of climate change. 
For example, a small increase in surface temperature will result in a large increase in outgoing infrared energy. And this outgoing energy from the surface would slow the temperature change and help stabilize the climate. Hence, there is no evidence that a runaway greenhouse effect ever occurred on Earth and there is no indication that it will occur in the future. How the positive feedback occurs to increase the change or output? The result of a reaction is amplified to make it occur more quickly. Here we have the positive feedback mechanism and the water vapor, which well, water vapor temperature feedback. The initial increase in temperature is reinforced by the other processes. If this feedback were left unchecked, the Earth's temperature would increase until the ocean evaporated away. Such a chain reaction is called the runaway greenhouse effect. We have also, after the water vapor, vapor temperature feedback, we have also the snow albedo feedback. The climate processes were a change in the area of ice cups, glacier, and sea planets, and sea ice alters the albedo and surface temperature of a planet. Ice is very reflected, reflective. Therefore, some of the solar energy is reflective back to space. So these are the two phenomena that were the examples of positive feedback mechanism. So we all know that positive feedback occurs to increase the change or output. So increase niya ang change or output. The result of this reaction is to amplify. Gina amplify niya to more to make the result quick. And the next feedback mechanism is the negative feedback mechanism. Okay. So for negative feedback mechanism, the negative feedback occurs to reduce the change for our output. The result of a reaction is reduced to bring the system back to a stable state. So in contrast with the positive, uh, positive feedback mechanism, which is it amplify, it amplify to make it occur more quickly. And negative feedback, it will make, it will reduce to bring the system back to a stable state. And then, example, uh, uh, the, the negative feedback mechanism tend to weaken, okay? It reduces the tend to weaken the interaction among the variables rather than reinforce them. So a good example of a negative feedback mechanism will be an increase in temperature increasing the amount of cloud cover. The increased cloud thickness or amount could reduce incoming solar radiation and limit the global warming. But as I have said earlier that if the as if left unchecked, the snow albedo feedback would produce a runaway ice age, which of course, it is not likely on Earth because other feedback mechanisms in the atmosphere system are constantly working to moderate the magnitude of the cooling. And during the geologic past, the Earth's surface has undergone extensive modification. One involves the slow shifting of the continents and the ocean floors, and this motion is explained in the widely accepted theory of plate tectonics, which is formerly known as the theory of continental drift. This theory states that the Earth's outer shell is composed of huge plates that fit together like pieces of jigsaw puzzle. The plates which slides over a partially molten zone below them, move in relation to one another. Continents are embedded in the plates and move along like luggage riding piggyback on a conveyor belt. The rate of motion extremely slow, only a few centimeters per year. That is for the theory of tectonic plates. And, and, this, and in this area or in this slide, 
we will know the connections of the climate change, plate tectonics, and mountain building. Since we already know the theory of plate tectonics, besides providing insights into many geological processes, plate tectonics also helps to explain past climates. For example, we find glacial features near sea level in Africa today, suggesting that the area underwent a period of glaciation hundreds of millions of years ago. And the Earth is composed of a series of moving plates. The rate at which plates move move or spread spread may influence the global climate during times of rapid spreading increased volcanic activity may promote global warming by enriching the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere for next we have the milankovic theory at the milankovic theory the milankovic theory it is a theory ascribing climatic changes to variation in the Earth's orbit. Earth's orbit is the that is named for the astronomer Milutin Milankovitch, who first proposed the idea in 1930s. He is a Serbian scientist that hypothesized the long-term collective effects of the changes in Earth's position relative to the Sun are a strong driver of Earth's long-term climate and are responsible for triggering the beginning and end of glaciation periods, which is the Ice Age. The basic premise of this theory is that as Earth travels through the space, three separate cyclic movements combine to produce the variation in the amount of the solar energy that falls in the Earth. Changes in isolation are in turn driven by Earth's natural orbital, orbital oscillation, termed the Milankovitch cycles. The three elements of Milankovitch cycles are eccentricity, obliquity, obliquity, and precision. That Milankovitch cycle, Milankovitch cycles that combines to produce variation in solar radiation received at the Earth's Earth face includes first changes in the shape or the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Second is the precision, the precision of the Earth's axis of rotation or wobbling. The third is the changes in the tilt or the obliquity of the Earth's axis. The first cycle of Milankovitch is the eccentricity. It deals with the changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit as the Earth revolves around the Sun. To go from less elliptic, elliptical to more elliptical and back again takes about 100,000 years. The greater the eccentricity of the orbit, that is the more eccentric the orbit, the greater variation in solar energy received by the Earth between its closest and farther, farthest approach to the sun. Presently, we are in a period of low eccentricity. The Earth is closer to the sun in January and farther away in July, and that is the opposite years ago. The second cycle takes into ac account the fact that as the Earth rotates in its axis, it wobbles like a speeding top. This wobble known as the precision of the Earth's axis that occurs in a cycle of, a, of about 23,000 years. And presently, the Earth is closer to the Sun in January and farther away in July. Due to precision, the reverse will be true in about 11,000 years. And then the third cycle takes about 41,000 years to complete and relates to the changes in tilt or the obliquity of the Earth as it orbits the Sun. Presently, the Earth's orbital tilt is 23 and one half degree Celsius a degree, but during the 41,000 year cycle, the tilt varies from about 22 degree to 24 and one half degree. The smaller the tilt, the less seasonal variation 
there is between summer and winter in middle and high latitudes. Thus, winters tend to be mid milder and summers tend to be cooler. During the warmer winters, more snow would probably fall in polar regions due to the air's increased capacity for water vapor. And during the cooler summers, less snow would melt as a consequence. As a consequence, the periods of smaller tilt would tend to promote the formation of glaciers in high latitude. Okay, this is the conditions now in the eccentricity. So we have here the ang condition now is that the January and July is the really the opposite of the condition in about 11,000 years ago. Still, other factors may work in conjunction with the Earth's orbital changes to explain the temperature variation between glacial and interglacial periods. Some of these are the amount of dust and other aerosols in the atmosphere. Second is that the reflectibility of the ice sheets. Third, the concentration of other trace gases such as methane. And fourth, the changing characteristic of the clouds. And fifth, the rebounding of land having been depressed by ice. The melancholic cycles in association with other natural factors may explain the advance and retreat of ice over periods of 10,000 to 100,000 years. And then, we have the climate change and the atmospheric particles. First is the aerosol in the troposphere. The aerosol, the tropospheric aerosols derive from many sources and they are distributed in the atmosphere through turbulence and direct atmospheric transport of air masses. They are removed by precipitation, coagulation, and sediment, which is the dry impaction. One of the sources is non-precipitating clouds. And aerosols enter the lower atmosphere in a variety of ways. In a variety of ways, for example, from factory and auto emissions, agricultural warning, the wild line, the wild land fires, and dust storms. Some particles, such as soil dust and sulfate particles, mainly reflect and scatter in coming sunlight, while others, such as the smoky soot, readily absorb to sunlight which warms the air around them. Aerosols that reduce the amounts of sunlight reaching the Earth's surface tend to cause net cooling of the surface air during the day. Certain aerosols also selectively absorb and emit infrared energy back to the surface, producing a net warming of the surface air that night. However, the overall net effect of human-induced aerosols on climate is to cool the surface. Okay? Ang effect sa aerosol is to cool the surface. And then, after the aerosols in the tropospheres, of course, we have the sulfate aerosols. So, mojgit ni sila ang mga common nga, nga contents sa atong aerosols in our troposphere. So, what are these aer sulfate aerosols? The sulfate, sulfate aerosols absorb no sunlight, but they reflect. But they reflect it. And thereby, reducing the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth's surface. Surf, sulfate aerosols are believed to survive in the atmosphere for about 3 to 5 days. And then, the sulfate Aerosols is the reason why the northern hemisphere has warmed less than the southern hemisphere during the past several decades and why the United States has experienced little warming compared to the rest of the world and why most of the global warming has occurred at night and not during the day, especially overpopulated areas. It is because of the sulfate aerosols. And in sulfate aerosols reflect reflect incoming sunlight and which tends to lower the Earth's surface temperature during the day. So, diba, why it answer, it is the reason why most of the global warming has occurred at night 
and not during the day, especially in the overpopulated areas because it tends to lower the Earth's surface temperature during the day. Kaya i-reflect man niya ang sunlight. And sulfate aerosols may also modify clouds by increasing their reflectability and because sulfate pollution has increased in significantly over industrialized areas of Eastern Europe, Northern, Northeastern North America, and China, the cooling effect brought on by these particles may explain. Okay? May explain those three. Why the Northern Hemisphere has warmed less than the Southern Hemisphere during the past several decades and why the United States has experienced little warming compared to the rest of the world. And of course, like I, as I have said kanina, that why that it is the reason why most of the global warming has occurred at night and not during the day, especially in the overpopulated areas. Next is the volcanic eruption and aerosols in the stratosphere. The large volcanic eruptions rich in sulfur can affect the climate. As sulfur gases in the stratosphere transform into tiny reflective sulfuric acid particles, they prevent a portion of the sun's energy from reaching the surface. And scientists agree that the volcanic eruptions having the greatest impact on climate are those rich in sulfur gases. Diba as kanina that as I have as the previous slides states that ang mga sulfur phos, um, sulfur, sulfur aerosols, sulfate aerosols, reflects the sunlight. So, it has impact on climate. These gases over a period of about two months combine with water vapor in the presence of sunlight to produce a tiny reflected sulfuric acid. And the particles that grow in size forming a dense layer of haze. The haze may reside in the stratosphere for several years and absorbing the reflecting back to space a portion of sun's incoming energy. The absorption of the sun's energy along with the absorption of infrared energy from the earth warms the stratosphere. The reflection of the incoming sunlight by the haze tends to cool the air and the earth's surface, especially in the hemisphere where the eruption of course occurs. So as you remember, when the Taal volcano um, erupts, of course, um, some of the televisions have reported about the impacts of the haze of that eruption. And this is why, and this is why, because when the volcano, Volcano erupts, the gas that it erupts contains a sulfur, and that sulfur really impacts the climate change because it reflects the incoming sunlight that causes by the haze it produces. And then we have the climate change and variation in solar output. Changes in the solar energy output in watts per square meters as measured by the Earth's radiation budget satellite and bottom curve represents the yearly average number of sunspots. As you can see, there is a figure in the left. Okay. Ang upper curve, ang upper curve is the watts per square meter as measured by the Earth's radiation budget satellites. It is the changes in the solar energy output. And the bottom curve represents the yearly average number of sunspots. As sunspot activity increases from minimum to maximum, the sun's energy output increases by about 0.1%. Diba katong suns, suns, sunspot, ikatong block na dark, the dark spot of the sun, and then kana siya nga spot kay much cooler than the rest of the parts of the sun. Ito some 
To sum up, the fluctuation in the solar output may account for climatic changes over time, scales of decades and centuries. To date, many theories have been proposed linking some solar variations to climate, climate change, but none have been proven. However, instruments aboard satellites and solar telescopes on the Earth are monitoring the sun to observe how its energy output may vary. Because many years of data are needed, it may be some time before we fully understand the relationship between the solar activity and climate change on Earth. Hey, so we have we shall ha uh, we shall we shall have brief review brief review before going on to the next section next section. So here is a brief review on some of the facts that and concepts we covered so far. First is the Earth's climate is constantly undergoing change, and evidence suggests that throughout much of the Earth's history, the Earth's climate was much warmer than it is today. So, mas warm ang before nga climate kaysa karun. The most recent glacial period or ice age began about 2 million years ago, and during this time, glacial advances were interrupted by warmer periods called interglacial periods. In North America, glaciers reach their maximum thickness and extend about 18,000 to 22,000 years ago and disappeared completely from North America by about 8,000 years ago. The Younger Dry Ass event represents a time about 11,000 years ago when North Eastern North America and Northern Northern Europe reverted back to glacier conditions. Over the last hundred years or so, the Earth's surface temperature has increased by about 0 0.7 degrees Celsius or 1.2 degree Fahrenheit, and the shifting of continents along with the volcanic activity and mountain building proposes how climate, climate variations can take place over a million of years. And the Milankovic theory in association with other natural forces proposes that alternating glacial and interglacial episodes during the past 2 million years are the result of small variation in the tilt of the Earth's axis and in the geometry of the Earth's orbits around the Sun. Trapping bubbles in the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica reveals that Carbon dioxide levels and methane levels were lower during colder glacial periods and during warmer interglacial periods. The sulfate aerosols in the troposphere reflects incoming sunlight, which tends to lower the Earth's surface temperature during the day, and sulfate aerosols may also modify clouds by increasing the clouds' reflectability. And the volcanic eruptions reach, which is rich in sulfur may be responsible for cooling periods in the geologic past and fluctuation in solar output, which is the brightness, may account for climatic change over time scales of the decades and centuries. In the previous sections, we saw how increasing levels of carbon dioxide may have contributed to changes in global climate spanning thousands and even millions of years. Today, we may be undertaking a global scientific experiment by injecting vast quantities of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere without really knowing the long-term consequences. The next section describes how carbon dioxide and other trace gases may be enhancing the Earth's greenhouse effect, producing the global warming. And for the next topic, we will tackle about the carbon dioxide and greenhouse effect and recent global warming. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that strongly absorbs infrared radiation and plays a major role in the warming of the lower atmosphere. We also know that CO2 has been increasingly steadily in the atmosphere, primarily due to the burning of the fossil fuel. However, Deforestation may be also adding to this increase as tropical rainforests are cut 
down and replaced with plants less efficient in removing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Collectively, the increase in these gases is about equal to carbon dioxide in their ability to enhance the atmospheric greenhouse effect. And then the ocean clouds and global warming. The thinning of the clouds over the ocean exacerbate, exacerbate global warming by leading to more rapid temperature increases. According to the results of the new study published today, the research combined data collected by observers on ships and satellites going back over a century. And oceans and clouds play an important part in the Earth's climate system. Oceans and clouds play an important part of Earth's climate system because they will respond to increasing global temperature is not clear and oceans may well add water vapor to atmosphere which might promote warming by enhancing the greenhouse effect. An increase in global cloudiness could potentially enhance or reduce the warming produced by increasing greenhouse gases. The oceans influence climate by absorbing solar radiation and releasing heat needed to drive the atmospheric circulation. By releasing the aerosols that influence cloud cover by emitting most of the water that falls on the land as rain by absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it for years to millions of years. The oceans absorb much of the solar energy that reaches Earth and thanks to the high heat capacity of water, the ocean can slowly release heat over many months or years. And of course, the ocean is the most the ocean is the most absorber of the carbon dioxide. Okay, di ba? As we all know that, na makaimuingon kita nga, unsay ang, unsa man jud ang moabsorb sa carbon dioxide. Di ba? Maingon tanga ang leaves, ang trees, sa lands. But actually, it is the ocean because the ocean naadira ang phytoplanktons, ang pa, kanang phytoplanktons, dogfeed sila sa carbon dioxide. Sila ang absorb sa carbon dioxide and they will release the oxygen. So what are the possible consequences of global warming? The effect that increasing levels of carbon dioxide might have on the upper atmosphere is not totally clear. However, climate models suggest that while the lower atmosphere or the troposphere readily steadily warms, the upper atmosphere or the stratosphere the mesosphere and the thermosphere will cool. The cooling is brought on by the additional molecules of carbon dioxide emitting more infrared radiation both upward and downward. And these are the possible consequences of global warming. First is that global warming can alter the distribution of the world's water resources and affect the productivity of the agricultural region. Next, it can cause the rise in global mean sea level. So, mas mutaas, mas mutaas ang sea level niya, meaning high tide, of course, mas magamay ang ato ang land. And then, by changing weather patterns, there is a global warming that could cause a higher frequency and intensity of hurricanes. And it can cause shifts in the path of a large scale cyclonic storms. And global warming could also cause changes in the frequency and intensity of heat waves and drought. Is the warming real? Tinood ba na anay global warming? It is indeed. Because the interaction between the Earth and its atmosphere are so complex, it is difficult to unequivocally prove that the recent warming trend has been due to primarily to increasing concentration of greenhouse gases. The problem is that any human-induced signal of climate change is superimposed on a background of cl natural climatic variation, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation or the Enzo Phenomenon. Moreover, in the temperature observations, it is difficult to separate a signal from the noise of the natural climate variability, the, intergovern the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the IPCC, a committee of over 2,000 leading Earth scientists considered the issues of climate change in a report published in 1990. 
updated in 1992 and again in 1995. The report concluded that emissions resulting from human activities are substantially increasing the atmospheric concentration of the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Many greenhouse gases remain in the atmosphere for a long time, which is decades to centuries in the case of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides. Hence, such gases enhance the greenhouse effect up to hundreds of years. Global mean surface air temperature has increased between 0 0.3 degree to 0 0.6 degrees Celsius since the late 19th century. And the cooling effect of sulfate aerosols resulting from sulfur emissions may have offset a significant part of the greenhouse warming during the past several decades. And carbon dioxide concentration are likely to reach 500 parts per million by the year of 2100. Increasing the levels of greenhouse gases are likely to cause the global mean surface air temperature to increase between 1 degree and 3.5 degrees Celsius, so with the best estimate being 2 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. The global sea level has risen by between 10 and 25 centimeters over the past 100 years and much of the rise may be related to the increase in global mean temperature. The average sea level is expecting to rise between 15 and 95 centimeter with the best estimate to being 50 centimeter by the year 2100. Warmer global temperatures will lead to a more vigorous hydrological cycle and this prediction translates into prospects for more severe droughts and or floods in some places and less, less severe droughts and or floods in other places. There are many uncertainties, uncertainties in climate predictions, particularly with regards to the timing, magnitude, and regional, regional patterns of the climate change. And last, the report concludes that there are uncertainties in the magnitude and patterns of long-term natural climatic variability. Nevertheless, the balance of evidence suggests that there is a discernible human influence on global climate. Even though there there is uncertainty about the rate and patterns of future global warming, cutting down on the emissions of greenhouse gases and pollutants could have potentially positive benefits, such as reducing the acid rain, diminishing the haze, and slowing stratospheric ozone depletion. If the greenhouse warming proves to be less than today's consensus, these measures would certainly benefit humanity. So science, a scientist debates the causes and effects of global warming, modification of the Earth's surface taking place right now could potentially influence the immediate climate of certain regions. And for example, study shows that about half the rainfall of the Amazon River Basin is returned to the atmosphere through evaporation and through transpirations from the leaves of the trees. Consequently, clearing large areas of tropical rain, forests in South America to create open areas for farms and cattle ranges will most likely cause a decrease in evaporative cooling. And this decrease in turn could lead to a warming in that area of at least several degrees Celsius. In turn, the reflectability of the deforested area will change. Similar changes in albedo result from the overgrazing and excessive cultivation of grassland in semi-arid regions, causing an increase in desert condition, which is also a process known as the desertification. The desertification is a process of degradation of land, and degradation of process by which a fertile land changes itself into a de desert by losing its flora and fauna, and this can be caused by drought, deforestation, climate change, human activities, and improper agriculture. And this include also in the Philippines, it includes the mining activity.
And this ends my presentation about the climate change. And I hope you learned something from me. And thank you for watching. But before I will end the pres this presentation, I will uh, to s I will sum up the I will sum up the chapters and the topics we've covered. So in this chapter, we consider some of the many ways of Earth's climate can be changed. First, we saw that the Earth's climate has undergone considerable change during the geologic past, and some of the evidence for a changing climate comes from the three rings, which is the dendrochronology, the chemical analysis of oxygen isotopes in ice cores and fossil shells, and geologic evidence left behind by advancing and retreating glaciers. The evidence from, the, from these suggests that Throughout much of the geologic past, the Earth was much warmer, warmer than it is today. The Milankovitch theory proposes that alternating glacial and interglacial episodes during the past 2 million years are the results of small variation in the tilt of the Earth's axis and in the geometry of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And another theory suggests that certain cooler periods in the geologic past may have been caused by volcanic eruptions, which is rich in sulfur. Still another theory postulates that climatic variations on Earth might be due to the variation in the sun's energy output, and we examine how sophisticated climate models project that the Earth's surface will continue to warm by between 1 degree Celsius and 3.5 degree Celsius. By the year 2000, 100 as increasing levels of carbon dioxide and other trace gases enhance the atmospheric greenhouse effect we learned that more research is needed to improve these climate models especially in the area of the representation of clouds in order to better refine these estimates and that is all for this chapter 14 which is the climate change and again Thank you for watching and I hope you learned something.